let's talk a little bit about the history of DNA typing, some uses for DNA electrophoresis and DNA typing, and how it actually works. So let's start with our history. Um, DNA typing was not always used as a form of forensic evidence. I know a lot of younger people kind of think it's always been around, but it's actually a relatively recent um, new type of evidence. So let's start in 1980. A gentleman named Ray White described something called a polymorphic RFLP marker or RIFLIP. Stands for Random Fragment Length Polymorphism. And it was these ideas that everybody's DNA has these little segments of like junk DNA that don't really code for anything, but they repeat themselves and they're different in different people. And those can be examined, and each person's variety of RFLPs are unique. Um, in 1985, the first paper was published on the technique of the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. That's what we discussed in our previous video. In 1988, the FBI started keeping track of DNA casework. It wasn't commonly used yet, but it was something that was beginning to be discussed. In 1995, in the United Kingdom, the first DNA database was established as a way to track um, DNA analysis and DNA data within the United Kingdom. And one year later, the first case was solved in the UK, or in the United Kingdom, using mtDNA, also known as mitochondrial DNA, which we discussed in our first video. So in 1998, the FBI launched what is known as the CODIS database, which is the database that is most commonly thought of now. CODIS is the database that when someone says, oh, run that DNA through the database, CODIS is the database they're talking about. So CODIS has been around for about 22 years. Now, how is DNA used in forensics cases? Well, most cases that forensic uh, DNA is used in are sexual assault cases or murders. Think about it like this. Um, DNA is generally not going to be used in a case like a robbery or a breaking and entering. Um, it doesn't warrant it, and usually there's not a large amount of genetic material left behind in those cases. Usually we're looking for a match between a specific piece of evidence and a suspect. And we always need to go back and compare the DNA that's been collected to the victim's DNA profile to limit them as a contributor of that genetic information. Now, there are some challenges to using DNA because DNA isn't infallible and there are some things that have to be considered. First, mixtures have to be resolved, meaning if there's a mixture of male and female DNA or a salt a victim and assailant. Sometimes DNA can be very degraded. One of the biggest degraders of DNA is cleaning products like bleach. If somebody's tried to um, clean up um, blood, etc. It can interfere not with the DNA itself necessarily, but um, it might be an inhibitor to the polymerase chain reaction process or PCR. Um, one of the common PCR inhibitors is bleach. It can make it very difficult to copy DNA as needed, like we talked about in our previous video, um, to get a sample that is usable. Now, there are other uses for DNA other than murder cases and sexual assaults. One of the most common forms of DNA testing is human identity testing. This could include things like paternity testing, like identifying who the father of a child is. If you were like me and you spent summertime sometimes watching trash TV and or you were sick home one day and you caught the Maury Povich show and you always had those episodes where he came out with an envelope and a bunch of suspect kind of looking folks and said, ah, in this envelope are the results and you are not the father, etc. Um, it can also be used in historical investigations. For example, the case of Tsar Nicholas. Um, if you know your basic Russian history, um, prior to 
World War I, um, the Tsar and the Tsarina and all their children were brutally murdered and the bodies disposed of. And um, almost 100 years later, those remains were recovered and identified using DNA analysis. Um, if you're a fan of the movie Anastasia, I regret to inform you that Anastasia's remains were also found in the mass grave with the rest of her family. Sorry. Um, these techniques were also used to identify the remains of the um, outlaw Jesse James in the Wild West. It can also be used in missing persons investigations. Um, if somebody disappears and a body turns up, they might be able to match it back to that individual. Oftentimes, they are used in times of mass disasters, um, say after a plane crash, or indeed this technique was used after 9-11 to determine whether small amounts of human remain belong to um, specific individuals. Um, now it's um, commonly used in the military. The, if you go into the military, you will be given a DNA quote-unquote dog tag that identifies you in case um, you are killed in action. And there is also a convicted felon DNA database. Anybody in this country that is convicted of a felony will have their DNA sampled, sequenced, and placed into the known convicted felon database.